Welcome to the Modern Mythos Podcast, a show dedicated to Call of Cthulhu and other investigative horror games. I'm Seth Skorkowski. And I'm John Hook. Together we'll discuss writing, game mastering, player tips, and how you can apply them to your table. And today we're joined by Chiasium's line editor for Call of Cthulhu, Mike Mason. Today we're going to discuss our favorite sources of horror in movies, TV, books, and games. Welcome, Mike. Welcome. Hello! It's good to be here. Oh, thanks for coming. Thanks for inviting me. It's always a uh, pleasure to uh, to talk to uh, yourself, Seth and John. So uh, I'm looking forward to it. Oh, uh, well, it's, we're glad to have you. It's taken too long to finally get you on the show. <laughs> so, so Mike, how uh, how did you get into uh, well gaming in general, but then into Call of Cthulhu? Gaming in general, crikey! Uh, that, well, that's going back. That's going back to the late 1970s, and uh, a friend invited me to their birthday party and uh, to play a game. And I thought it was like a board game because that's all I knew. And I turned up, and there's like six people there around the dinner table with some, you know, well, what I know as now is some you know, cardboard floor plans and some. Um, uh, miniatures of skeletons and wizards and fighters and um and we played D. &D. um <laughs> i didn't know it was called D, &D till the end of the session and, uh, <laughs> and there was a crazy dice and um i was completely hooked within about one millisecond because it's like these <laughs> miniatures are awesome this game is fantastic what are we doing well, let's carry on let's just play all weekend but um but obviously, you know, all good things have to end. So, uh, you know, eventually uh, we stopped. And uh, and then I just went out and saw what is this role-playing thing and, you know, tried, you know, found found a local role-playing, well, a store that sold role-playing games, which was actually in the, in the next, in the city along, because I lived in a town in the city. So I managed to get my family to take me there so I could buy, you know, White Dwarf and discover that and and all the joys of role-playing games in the late 1970s um that's kind of how it started like the idea of a, a, a kid going to a, a birthday party it has this life-altering course of events just suddenly <laughs> you know kick off <laughs> yeah absolutely i mean it was it, it 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 helped that my history teacher um at that time was a gamer he i mean in history lessons, he already used historical board games to teach us, you know, about the Trojans and English Civil War. And, you know, we wouldn't play full games, but he would, you know, do little bits of games. So we would kind of, you know, engage us. And then um, I don't know what, what, what was in the air that autumn, but soon after I'd kind of done that birthday party, he um, started a games club at school after school. And um, so, um, it began with some kind of historical war gaming, but quickly within about, well, you know, by the next session, it was all D and D and role playing games. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> awesome! He would he would go off, you know, to London and come back with a bag of miniatures and some books. Say, I bought some stuff that you might like. If anyone wants it, I'll sell it you at the price. You know, I paid for it, and we'd have bidding wars about who would buy the ogre or the wizard miniature, and it was, you know. Great. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. And then uh, when, when did you get into Call of Cthulhu? Um, so that would be um, probably around about 80, I think, probably about 83. Um, second edition. So, yeah, well, in the UK, it would, it was, it would be the second third edition uk kind of box that game oh sure did. okay so we you know i'd, I'd never seen a you know one inch cares in box kind of thing uh, unless it was a runequest one um in call of Cthulhu in the uk it was a big deep kind of i don't know two inch box kind of thing but it was the same material it's just you know printed in the uk under license um so um that came out i didn't really understand what it was or know what it was and didn't really know if it was something i was interested in but then a friend at school, a good uh, lifelong friend of mine, Dave, he um, he kind of got into it before me. And at school, he bought, he showed me the cover of the asylum with the proto-shoggoth on the front. 
And right. um, I just went, that looks awesome. What's this? He said, this is Call of Cthulhu, and it's a, like a horror game. I said, that sounds fantastic. Let's play now. And <laughs> um, and kind of, so Dave kind of introduced me to it, and I just immediately went and bought the box set, devoured that, and went, this is the game for me. And um, we would all meet on a Friday night and play whatever we were playing. You know, it was very soon, you know, not long after that, we started playing masks and all died horribly. And, and, uh, and um, yeah, yeah. And I'm still playing with some of the guys in that group today, to be honest. So uh, it um, was the real foundation of it all, really. I, I love that. One of the things John and I talk about is... I, I have stories of people that I've played with for, for decades. And uh, so, you know, I kind of have a very different perspective versus John doesn't have that. So I'm really happy to hear you say, it's like, yeah, I still play with like some of those same guys, you know, years and years and years later. So uh, that's, that to me is wonderful because that's the situation I'm in, just not as long of a timeline. No, this is, I mean, it, I, I, you know, obviously I can only speak for myself, but I mean, you know, uh, uh, most of the strongest friendships I have through life were made, have been made through, you know, people I game with, you know, at different points in my life and still game with or still know and still friends, you know, and um, yeah, it's just, it's that kind of common hobby that brings people together and, um, and some friendships, you know, really kind of last, a, last the test of time because of that. Yeah. It's, that is true. I, I do have one friend who I've we've known each other now 35 years because we met when we were serving in the army together and we were roommates and we played D&D. &D. And I mean, I can't tell you how many hours we've played D&D &D in Germany and then, you know, came stateside and that bond, that friendship, you know, lasted and you know, we ended up going to college together and he introduced me to my wife and we, you know, did more gaming and stuff together. But yeah, some of my uh, longest and deepest friendships are also built through gaming. And aside from gaming, let us uh, flip to our, our first topic of uh, horror movies uh, that, uh, or I guess medium. So I guess we include TV and books in there that, uh, we enjoy, uh, maybe drew some inspiration from, uh, you know, ones that you could kind of consider influential or anything that, uh, that you enjoyed. So, and we'll go ahead and start with you, Mike. What, uh, what, what sort of horror movies do you enjoy? Don't you have to be Call of Cthulhu type horror, just stuff you like. <laughs> good, good, good. I, I, I mean, I've loved, I, I love horror films and have done since, all right, I, one of my earliest memories is being on a train platform waiting for a train and there being a poster of uh, for this horror film that I knew nothing about. All I knew was the poster. Um, and it was a poster of this pram. Uh, and you can't see into the pram, but all you can see is some kind of claw-like hands coming out and maybe maybe a, some piercing eyes or something. And, um, and, the, po and, and, and it, it, the film was called It Lives, I think. And uh, I knew nothing about it, and um, and it really, you know, really caught my imagination. Like, what's in the pram? It's like <laughs> horrible thing. And um, and uh, and now I know it's a mutant baby because I've seen the film. You know, subsequently. <laughs> <laughs> However, um, so, so I mean, at an early age, kind of film posters and things really caught my eye, and Hammer films, and and so I, I just lapped all that up and. In you know the early eighties, um, you know we we had a, a, a home video player, and um, so in the UK at the time, it suddenly was like all these films that were you couldn't see at the cinema because they were banned, or they were you know they were old and you know they were kind of like you know, only whispered about, but you could never see them again because obviously films don't get reshown back in the day. Suddenly, you know, you could get hold of The Exorcist and you could get hold of. Well, all these things like the, you know, John Carpenter's a thing, and all, all this kind of stuff. And so, you know, I started to devour things like that, and you know, an American Wealth in London, and um, and so I, I've always loved, you know, horror horror films, horror books. I, you know, picking up horror books um, from the secondhand bookshop where I, you know, where we lived, and and all of that kind of stuff. So, 
picking horror films that I are my favourites is really one of the hardest things in the world because I like most of them. It just you know depends on the day of the week or the time of the year. Um, for me, uh, I mean, you know, I try not to list a load of films because that would be useless to anyone. But that, but my number one favourite film of all time is Jaws, just because it's to me the kind of the ultimate monster movie. It's just done perfectly well, and and it's just just great. It's it's funny, it's scary, it's gripping, and I can just watch it again and again and again, and it just never gets old. It's just a a masterpiece to me of uh, of cinema. But um, to put that aside, because everyone knows Jaws, so I, I tried to pick a few films that may, well, people will have heard of, but maybe, maybe they haven't seen or, or maybe they want to relook at. But um, I read a little list, and um, the first one I would say is Frailty, which is the um, 2002 film um, directed and starring Bill Paxton. Do, is, are you familiar with that one, guys? No, I haven't seen that one. Okay, so um, it's got uh, Bill Paxton stars in it, but also uh, Matthew McConaughey. Um, and it's a modern kind of day, bit of a whodunit kind of, uh, but it's it's got a framing device of Matthew McConaughey walks into a kind of an FBI office and says, I know who the killer is you're looking for kind of thing. And then kind of it kind of goes back and it relates this Bill Paxton story of this Bill Paxton is a single father with two young boys who he's looking after. And basically one day he kind of comes back and sort of says, I've, I've had a message from God. There are demons in the world and God has told me my mission is to expose and destroy them. And he then goes about with the two, well, sometimes with the two boys on this mission. Um, I won't go into too much detail because I don't want to spoil it. But suffice to say, one of the boys believes him and one of the boys goes, I think he's mad. You know, I, I think he's losing it, as it were. And so you've got this kind of internal kind of dynamic of the family of kind of like, because you kind of, as a, as a viewer, kind of go, well, you know, surely, you know, this is about him, you know, mentally deteriorating in some way or having some kind of delusion or something. Or And then on the other hand, you've got, the, is, is it, you know, is that, are demons real? Are they not? Kind of thing. So you've got all that going on. You've got this framing story. Um, and it's just it's just great. It's, it's a fantastic um, kind of um, examination of, uh, you know, horror and and uh, and how, where, when do you say to someone, stop, you know, and uh, when their conviction is so, so, you know, um, so strong. That will that will be on my list. I figured like at the end of this is like I'm gonna have a big list of movies to uh, to to watch uh, once we're we're done talking because every time John and I have talked about media, I live I leave with a list of stuff of like man I need to catch up. So frailty Jaws any anything else because I like the measure of things you can revisit a lot. Okay, okay. Well, I will go around, but I'm sure you guys have got some some films as well. But I mean. Um, Rec one and two, the original Spanish films, R E C, like Rec, as in recording. I don't know if you've seen those, but there was a US remake, um, and then a sequel, which has, which is, um, I think it's oh, Rec two, the uh, it's kind of set in an airport kind of thing, um, which has got, which is a completely different story to the Rec two original Spanish film. There are some other <laughs> films that follow on in the Spanish one. There's kind of Rec three and four kind of thing, but not really worth watching but wreck one and two are great because it, it, i mean it, it's a it's a call of cthulhu scenario basically you, you you have a tv um a reporter who basically is going to um go with a, a, a team of firefighters on their evening shift and just kind of you know bring in the cameraman film it as is a bit of fly on the wall kind of documentary about the you know the life of a firefighter kind of thing and they very soon get called to this kind of apartment block in the middle of this, you know, Spanish city, um, where weird stuff suddenly happens, and they find they're locked in, and there are things inside that want to eat them all. And um, when they try and get out, they realise the building's been sealed, and the you know the police outside and the authorities have sealed the building, won't let them out because there's obviously something contagious inside that they won't let out. Um, and it kind of, you know, so it starts off a kind of like a bit like a, 
I guess, a bit like a zombie. It's a kind of zombie film to some degree, but it's not also because it's about, you know, where do the zombies come from? Who, What's doing it? And and it's, there's, it opens it out to a much more kind of wider kind of thing. And there's kind of, you know, there's a bloke in the attic who's been doing very bad experiments and things and, you know, using, you know, tomes of, you know, forbidden law and all that kind of stuff. And Rec 2 basically just follows on, basically. But I have to say, um, the American um, remake, I've good as well, the, the, the American one is pretty much a straight, same the same film, Rec 1, Rec 1, US and Spanish versions. But Rec 2, the US version, is um, is well worth a watch just because they do something different. They, they take it in a different direction and they move out and they it, I think they, they end up in an airport and trying to get on the plane and all this kind of stuff going on while this all chaos is going around. Um, and I, I enjoyed that as well. But the, the original Spanish ones are uh, uh, well worth uh, well worth watching just because you've got a bunch of people that live in apartments. You've got some firefighters, a TV reporter and stuff happening that they've got to deal with now. And it's like, well, this is a call of Cthulhu party. <laughs> and when, when somebody gets killed, there's somebody in the other apartment who can come out and, what are you? I'm a doctor. Right, you're a PC. Right, get on. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> the whole apartment's just like a, a magazine of new PCs ready to be deployed. Exactly. Yeah. I, yeah. I've never understood the uh, uh, Hollywood need to remake uh, films as the American versions. Uh, you know, I don't mind remakes uh, of of older films. Uh, I. I I have no problem with that, but whenever they take like a new movie or they just make the American version of it, it it, it seems so weird. I think uh, the, the girl with the dragon tattoo, and uh, I I've, I still haven't seen the original uh, The Ring, but yeah, you know, as well as I, I saw the America with that somebody's like, well, you know, that's a, a really popular a Japanese movie that's not that old. Like what? <laughs> it's so interesting because they 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 do. I mean, The Ring is a good case book because I mean, the 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 US remake with um, Naomi Watts, isn't it? Um, it's a pretty good film. I, I I I enjoyed it, and and it is the same story, but they but they different things kind of happen in a, you know obviously the same plot happens, but in a in, you know there's some variation, and it's kind of, you know it's in, I, I thought it's a great film. The original Ring is a great film as well, and is more scary. Um, I don't know I don't know what it is. Maybe. When it's in your language and you know it's a Hollywood film, it feels a little safer. But when it's a kind of cultural, something a little different to, you know, that you're familiar with and it's a little, I don't know, lower budget and, I don't know, it, it kind of gets you more sometimes. And certainly the the, the original Ring, um, you know, that very kind of famous bit that I won't spoil, but towards you know, the end of the film when you know, there's a TV involved, um, is is terrifying, really. <laughs> It's interesting talking about remakes and things. I mean, The Grudge is another interesting one. The Grudge, the um, I, I can't remember the filmmaker's name offhand, but um, he made. I mean, he he's remade that film at least three times. He, 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 <laughs> he made an original version, then he remade it again, and then I think he directed the the US version as well. So I mean, he's it was everybody. He, it was him. It, it wasn't even the other director trying to take it on. It's kind of him kind of crafting the film and every. So every version, I think, is just him kind of honing the film down to his vision, I guess. So, um, so the uh, the US version, of The Grudge, is uh, is probably one of them. It's got some like, really terrifying points in, and um, well worth watch. Yes. Well, like when you when you mentioned like the the same director coming back and and redoing it, um, it wasn't the same director, but he was heavily involved in the remake. Uh, one of mine is the the Tom Savini directed Night of the Living Dead, which yeah, you know, a lot of people I, I guess that don't know anything about it would you know it's like well he's 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 you know disrespecting Romero. It's like you do realize that Romero was like involved the whole way through it because uh, yeah it was I think Savini went off to Vietnam right before they started filming. He was supposed to actually be involved in the original. He got you know drafted or uh, signed up and uh, he was gone. And then Romero crafts his abilities, finally gets some money because the first one was made on a shoestring. And they they redo it and Savini says, I'll handle the directorship. 
and I find it uh, far more enjoyable than the the original. Uh, I think the original is great, but the that 1989, 1990 uh, Night of Living Dead uh, was was one of mine, heavily influential, and I can rewatch that. I rewatched it many many times, and I still enjoy it because uh, there, there's sometimes you watch a horror movie and you're like wow, I saw that. And even if you're like, it's like, and I don't really care if I ever see it again. Just, you know, I, I had that, that, that one moment that, that I enjoyed it, but it doesn't always last through future viewings. Um, and that's, I said, that's definitely one of mine, but I think, I think a lot of the, the Romero fans kind of consider it sacrilegious that I say, I prefer the, the remake version that he wrote and produced. <laughs> I just I just get the impression they were, they were good friends and you know Savini certainly plays a key role behind and in front of the camera in Dawn of the Dead which is huh? oh yeah a fantastic film and um I was looking at Prime the other day Amazon Prime and I realized there's three different they've got three different cuts of Dawn of the Dead and I was mm. going like which one haven't I watched there's an extended cut there's the uh <laughs> the theatrical cut which I've definitely seen and there's the um Argento cut and I was doing my research going like, yeah, I've seen the extended, I've seen the theatrical, I've never seen the Argento cut. And it's got, it's kind of, it's a 50-50 what people say about it, whether it's any good or not. But I gave that a watch because obviously I'm a bit of completist and need to see them all. So, uh, but yeah, it's like Dawn of the Dead or uh, Night of the Living Dead as well. I mean, you know, if you happen to turn the TV on and wherever you are in, whatever point you are at, as you turn the TV on in that film, in those films, you just sit and watch it. It's, it's oh, oh, it just you know, instant. Pull you in, you know. No, yeah. instant. Dawn of the Dead was another one. I've, I I couldn't even name how many times I've watched that or forced my friends to to watch it. Uh, my only complaint with that it 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 is a it's a seventies movie style that uh, is I find them much more enjoyable to have seen or remember watching than the process of watching it because their pacing I always forget how slow the pacing is uh such as um you know with that one it's actually very slow for the bulk of the movie but when it's uh when it's exciting it is so exciting that you kind of quickly forget that you just spent 15 minutes literally watching people walk through an empty mall or you know just do nothing and you're beginning to kind of wane, and then all of a sudden it's exciting. Um, it's also how I feel about The Exorcist. I love The Exorcist at any moment that I'm not actively watching The Exorcist because <laughs> I always forget how slow and just kind of meandering the bulk of the, the movie is. But once I'm done, I'm like, oh man, I can remember a million things that I loved and how excited I was. But while I'm watching, it's like, Man, I really don't remember the scene going on so long, or just <laughs> they were building character. I can't agree. It kind of built. It's the atmosphere and building tension, and it's oh, it's just a just a great film. The uh, I mean, to me, the, the most scariest bit of The Exorcist is before the demon even arrives, and they're in the hospital. It's that hospital scenes are the scariest thing because they're so real. In the fact, you have some, you have a young child, and if you're a parent yourself. I think it kind of maybe affects you more because that that kind of point where there's something wrong but they don't know what it is and it's that kind of putting them through the tests and all that kind of thing and it's just genuinely a scary thing to me and um uh, and i find those kind of scenes you know really kind of disturbing in a way uh, so when the demon comes it's almost a relief kind of like, okay we're back to back to knitting socks in hell now so it's all good <laughs> now, now we're now we're on on to, to fantasy now, one thing with some contemporary filmmakers, though, that I, I think captured that 70s style, but did it in a modern way that I, I still enjoy a lot. Um, there was uh, The Others with Nicole Kidman that in every way feels like the old style horror, but isn't. It still has that slow pacing, but then uh, definitely uh, Get Out uh, was not. I mean, that one somehow hit that perfect point for me where it is it has that pacing and that feeling of the old horror of your leading up to something but at the same time i never felt oh wow we're really dragging this out it it, it, it hit that perfect moment where it didn't feel rushed but it didn't feel 
too slow and hit that kind of magical uh, just dread that you know something terrible is coming. No, I, I would agree. I think. I mean, I think that's the thing with modern films. They, 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 you know, at the end of the day, media learns from itself as history, as you know, as history goes on, and um, pacing is is different in a modern film to what you would see in a nineteen seventies film. In the on the whole, I mean, I love I love nineteen seventies film. There's something about the gritty, depressing nature of many seventies <laughs> film that if you kind of that it makes you feel a certain way, and it makes for me makes me remember the 70s, which is, you know, uh, uh, an interesting time, the 1970s. Wherever you are in the world, the 1970s were an interesting time in all in all the kind of variation, variation of that meaning. But, uh, yeah, I mean, Get Out does have that. It's great for pacing. It, it's a great story. It, um, it really riffs on the Ira Levin kind of material, um, which is obviously it's partly a homage to in some ways. And it's a great film. I mean, I enjoyed them as well. I, I thought, in in some senses, I thought them were sorry us, not them. Them <laughs> us was, um, them is about giant ants. That's really not what us is about. <laughs> um, us or us, however, however you want to pronounce it, is um, as a really genuinely kind of scary moments, which I've been discussing with the people. They didn't find scary at all. But that's 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 what they call about horror films. They scare people in different ways or they don't. Blair Witch, I think, is a really terrifying film. But I know many people who think it's a dull, boring film that's about as scary as their big toe, you know. <laughs> but it, that's fine because horror affects people in different ways. Yeah, I, uh, I remember years ago uh, when they re-released The Exorcist at theaters uh, and I was, I, was, I was at film school. So I was going through for my, my film snob phase of life. And... Uh, yeah, I, I took a buddy to go see it because I explained this was one of the, the most terrifying movies I ever watched. Because when I saw it the first time, I was the same age as that little girl, so I, I kind of had that perspective of I was 12. Uh, and when we went to go see it at the theaters, you know, we have seen countless bad horror movies together. And when they added the uh, the extra footage, it was a scene of her coming down the stairs upside down in some sort of spider pose. And that freaked us out so bad. And at this point, we're adults watching this. And later on, we were showing that to a friend, his girlfriend. And all the guys in the room who have seen this movie are like curled into these little balls of tension throughout the whole lead up. And she's just sitting there with, really, guys? Really? <laughs> and we're like, this does nothing for you. And she's like, no, this does nothing for me. And <laughs> so her having never seen it was just completely like, whatever. And the rest of us, they're like, oh my God, I know what's coming up. We're just absolutely uncomfortable and loving it. No, this, this is, I mean, it, it, it's very much like, you know, I, I on my list is The Wicker Man, you know, the Robin Hardy 1973 Sure, masterpiece of you know cinema as far as I'm concerned is fantastic, and I can just sit and watch it for hours. I mean, and it you know it's slow, it's got folk songs, it's fantastic, um, and it's got the most bone chilling end to a film you know that there is. Um, but I can completely get people just sit there watching it like, well, nothing happens, and that's not scary in any way. I get that. However, I can then go and watch Midsummer, the modern you know, remake kind of thing, um, which, you know, I kind of enjoyed. And I thought it was, I thought it was over long. I thought it very derivative. I didn't think it was scary in any way. Um, and I just, I just longed to come out of cinema and go, I kind of enjoyed it, you know, that it was good, but I don't think I need to ever watch it again. I'd rather just go home now and watch The Wicker Man, watch the original, uh, because to me it was better. But, um, but I get that, you know, younger people, where you know who haven't seen The Wicker Man and they see Midsummer will probably think Midsummer is the better film because it it, it, it speaks to them more because it's a, a more modern style of filmmaking perhaps I, I don't know but um, no. yeah, as I keep saying it's fine for people to like different things. I um, I actually just saw Midsummer this past week and because uh, I've seen the original Wicker Man. and I think at halfway through the Nick Cage version and then my streaming service just crapped out on that particular movie yeah sometimes like they just decide like 
we've decided you shouldn't watch any more of this and you keep trying well, to start it over again. That's completely fine because no one should. The, the, the Wicker Man has never been remade. There is not a <laughs> There are no but, movies. It doesn't exist. I, I went to the cinema and saw it on release, so nobody else ever had to. <laughs> so I, I never finished it uh, because yeah. even hours later, I'd come back and you'd be like, nope. No, we're not doing this. So my, my TV evidently has better taste than me, um, or is at least <laughs> looking out for my best interest. It sounds like the TV knew knew what you should and shouldn't be watching. And then I, I love Nick Cage films, but even me, but even 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 that that's, that's a that's a film too far, I'm afraid. John, well, you've been very quiet, John. What have, have you have you got a film that you want to throw in? I I I actually have several uh, film and TV and books. You know, so when I was a kid, um, probably the the most influential horror film for me was Poltergeist. I love Poltergeist, and and on on several different levels. For you know, one, I love ghost stories, and I love um, for me being able to to tell a ghost story or to experience a ghost story being unfolded. It's limitless. Uh, it, it, the ghost can do anything, and I just I love that uh, you can't define or pigeonhole a ghost because I feel like they're going to manifest and they can do anything. and And I try and take those lessons and bring them to the gaming table. But I also love body horror, and Poltergeist has that amazing body horror scene. You know, yeah, just tearing your own face off in the mirror. And it's so fantastic. I love everything about it. And then for myself, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've told this story before, but, you know, when I was a kid and the movie was out at the, at the cinema, that summer, my family was visiting a uh, family in Dallas. And so the, the moms, my mom and my aunt took four kids to the mall because that's what you did back in those days. You went to a mall and a mall had a theater in it right next to the food court. And so the moms were like, we're going to buy four tickets to Poltergeist and we're going to send the four kids in and the moms are going to wait in the, uh, in the food court. And I had a, I had one of those little Casio watches that you could squeeze and it would light up. And my mom and I, we were doing the 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 showtime math. Like, okay, if the next if the next showing is at this time, then your showing must end at you know back it up 15, 20 minutes at that time. So come and and you know because I since I was oldest, I was in charge of the kids. Come and meet us in the food court at X time, and I could check it on my Casio. And I'm like, absolutely, and I was totally into this all responsibility that I was given to care for my brother and my two cousins. So we go in and we're watching Poltergeist and it's scary as hell. And finally the, 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 the medium, the woman, uh, she's, she's done her thing and she brushes her hair and she says, this house is clean. And I'm thinking to myself, my heart is pounding. I'm thinking, man, that was an amazing movie. And I squeeze my watch and I look at the time and based on the, on the calculations my mom and I had made, I'm like, what the hell? There's 25 more minutes to the movie. And I was like, what could get even scarier than this? And <laughs> that was the scariest part for me was that there was still 25 minutes to this movie and it's already been declared clean. What's going to happen? So Poltergeist just rocketed to the top for me uh, and it stayed there my entire life. But Love, love, love that movie as well as Jaws. I, in fact, I just saw Jaws like two days ago. I just rewatched it. Um, uh, you know, and and, and I love. Oh, there's so many good things out there, and I have this giant list. I'm not going to drain through it all, but you know, you were talking about uh, some of the 1970s and and reworking and modern versions of that. So there is an author um, that I'm sure we're all familiar with, R. L. Stein. And R.L. Stein uh, has a plethora of, of horror books. But I would, for myself, I feel like most of his uh, books are normally aimed at a, at a younger audience. You know, it's, you know, he'll take the tropes, the horror tropes, and, and he'll do them in a, in a only slightly different way and kind of, you know, make them for kids. You know, Goosebumps. 
Well, there's a series, a, a trilogy of movies on Netflix right now. You can go and see it called Fear Street, which at first I had no idea was an R.L. Stein property. But these three movies are not aimed for kids. These are R-rated movies, and it's an amazing trilogy because it's by it's by years. So they have Fear Street 1994, Fear Street, oh gosh, what else is it? Uh, 78, 1978, and Fear Street 1666. And you're thinking, well, how is this? The times are going backwards. Listen, watch this trilogy. It is an R.L. Stein pro uh, uh, product, and they do have several uh, archetypes of some of these, you know, slasher guys. You know, so you've got the the masked guy with an axe, and you've got somebody else, you know, uh, a crazy girl with scissors, and you know, just there's all kinds of these uh, archetypes. But the way that this trilogy is executed and the way that it, they are strung together, it really is kind of taking these 1970 elements and modernizing it in the way that the story is being told. And it is fantastic. I really, really enjoyed that. What else? Oh, another Netflix series. And it's uh, Spanish uh, out of uh, Spain as opposed to uh, Mexico. 30 coins. Oh, God, yes. 30 coins. <laughs> Mike is not a fan. I'm telling you, I really, really liked it. It it had a lot of great elements to it. Uh, it had body horror elements. It had uh, religious elements. It, it just, it was, I thought, a really well-told series, and I enjoyed it. And it even brought in uh, a little bit of uh, uh, of the Cthulhu mythos, if you will, but with the the yellow sign. You know, there's the, the yellow sign is is visible a few times. Um, I really enjoyed Thirty Coins. I thought that was a lot of fun, and I uh, no, I was going to say no. I I I, I did enjoy it, John. I, I was I was teasing more than not. <laughs> I, I did enjoy it. I did. Um, I thought the actual overarching what the plot is about the 30 coins was the genuinely interesting point of it. Um, it, it did at times just feel like it was that and the kitchen sink, but I did enjoy it. It was completely <laughs> crazy and off its head and, and uh, I did, I did enjoy it. And of course the, the uh, director and writer is, is um, has written a Call of Cthulhu adventure because he's a massive Call of Cthulhu fan and gamer. So uh, oh, that's, right. and, uh, that's um, the, um, the macabre joke, um, uh, which is uh, I've been put out in in Spanish by our, our Spanish licensee, and um, hopefully at some point we'll you know we'll get around to be able to kind of doing a a translation uh, for of that of some kind. But no, it, it, it was I I wasn't particularly scared by it, but I, but I, I did enjoy. It. I mean, who, who doesn't enjoy the fact that the priest has a hidden vault with oozes in the bottom? Of it? <laughs> I know. Yeah, that, that's cool. In the church, in the church is the arsenal, I, right? I, uh, I I felt like they didn't stick the landing as well as I would have have liked. You know, by the end of the show, I feel like yeah, the kitchen sink was a good one, but the um, uh, to me, it it didn't feel as much Call of Cthulhu as it did uh, Cult Divinity Lost, uh, which is the, the mm, other horror yeah. game that I, I enjoy playing, and it it felt exactly like that. So I told my players like. Hey guys, you should totally watch this. This is 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 the the closest thing that's not a Clive Barker property is uh, is it for a movie that's like um, that game. But um, I, I I enjoyed it. It was the 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 mother with the child was the one where I'm like, oh my god, this is Dunwich. This is this is this is Dunwich on 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 speed. It is wonderful. So I uh, thirty coins impressed me. A lot. My wife and I devoured that. She likes to say she doesn't like horror movies, but then she enjoys horror movies. Uh, one of the things I realized is I'm not a big fan of slasher movies. Like when I was kind of thinking of my favorites, uh, Nightmare on Elm Streets and Halloweens and Friday the 13th, none of those 
made my my list like i enjoyed them but you know it's like i i appreciate the texas chainsaw massacre but it is not on my uh, list of ones i could watch a million times or i considered hugely influential uh, but i do love a religious edge um such as a, as a kid um the, the TV version, the edited for TV version, as years before I saw the actual R version, was uh, Children of the Corn. <laughs> Freaked me out. I, I still am uncomfortable around cornfields as, as a full-grown adult. Uh, and so I, I like that. And, yeah, and it always bothers me, the fact that, you know, they're they're made by by such a sewer person. But I love the the Polanski, uh Rosemary's Baby. I love The Ninth Gate. I, I could I consider those to be just spectacular, uh, especially the Ninth Gate. I've watched that countless times. And then, of course, The Omen, um, which I remember watching when I was way too young to watch The Omen. <laughs> and that movie uh, absolutely freaked me out as a kid. And uh, I love that. Um, and then with uh, on, on the Clive Barker side, for me growing up, I read a lot of Clive Barker when I was probably starting at 13 or so I, I read everything he wrote um and then for years it was oh there's a new clive barker book drop everything read the clive barker book and then get back to whatever i was doing um the the first two hellraisers after that you could say they're mess but the first two hellraisers to me were massive influential i remember that when high def tvs first came out and I, I went over to my buddy's house we were going to watch like the first four hellraisers on a super high def tv and you could see the cardboard sets and just <laughs> how low budget it was. It was like, man, this looked a lot better on a VHS tape on a crappy small. Definitely <laughs> are, it's meant to be viewed. <laughs> definitely. Definitely. No, I, I love the original. Yeah, I, I haven't seen the second Hellraiser in many, many years. I would like to see it again, but the original Hellraiser. And um, if we're going to spin off into media, then I would say, you know, if you're going to read any horror story collection then you should be reading the books of blood by clive barker because i mean to be honest they, every idea he had for a horror story he put into the, the those stories in the books of blood i mean you know what he's done subsequently has been much more fantastical and kind of less horror more fantasy and it's almost like you know he kind of drained his head of all the horror into i mean into the books of blood and um they are great they're, they're just short stories each oh. really really different and um you know if you don't like one of them you will like the next one because they're so varied i always said with barker his short fiction is horror his long fiction is fantasy uh i think the longest horror he did was the hellbound heart and it was a short little n novella but once you start getting up to to weave world or a magica or, or any of like his his full-length novels they're fantasy and they're usually portal fantasy of all things. They, they do have their, their dark moments, but none of them what I call horror. But yeah, when basically the, the, the less room you give him to write a story, the more horrific it, it becomes, which is why the books of blood are, are absolutely fantastic or uh, cabal or hell heart. Those were wonderful. But then you, you give him a hundred thousand words or more and he will give you a fantasy novel or now it is like a children's <laughs> novel. <laughs> just, just... Yeah, no, it is. It, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there, Seth, but definitely, definitely. Um, if, if we're talking old, uh, you know, old films, the, the original Evil Dead, the uh, 1981, Sam Raimi, um, for me, has always been a favorite. It's always been, you know, a scary film. I, lo I just love the bit when they're when uh, they're predicting cars. One of them is drawing cars out of the deck, and the other one's going Queen of Hearts, Jack of Hearts, or whatever. And it's just fantastically scary point. Um, but it would be remiss of me not to mention Mr. David Lynch and and the and the and the oeuvre of Mr. David Lynch, of which many of them have. You know, you wouldn't necessarily call them horror films, but have horror elements in them. You know, Mulholland Drive has possibly one of the most scariest scenes ever committed to film. It's got really not a lot to do with the plot of the film. It's just a really scary scene. Because of the app, it just <laughs> builds and builds and builds. And, and um, but if you, you know, if I was going to nominate one, you know, if you want to watch a, a David Lynch film during October, um, then it has to be a Razorhead, surely. You know, the 
1977 wow. black and white film. It took him years to make uh, his very first film that is just weird, horrific, strange. A strange cinema trip is probably the best way to describe <laughs> it. Um, but it absolutely riveting, you know, riveting. Well, I find it riveting, but uh, um, I guess it's not everyone's cup of tea either, though. But uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my favorite David is David Cronenberg. Uh, and I love the remake of The Fly with uh, Jeff Goldblum. Oh, my God. I haven't seen that one in a very long, oh, long time. So good. Uh, I, I, I remember enjoying it a lot, but also I haven't seen that in probably 20 years. Um, but... That was that was a case of, of remakes that you can do very well. Uh, Chris kind of touched on the thing, which is a, a a a remake that far surpasses the original. And then I went back and I read the original. I guess mm-hmm. novella. It's such a short little book, and was still like, nope, nope. Carpenter got that one better. Of you know cases where I, I consider the the movie was far better than the source material. Well, and the. The original black and white movie was more, uh, more closely adapted uh, to the book than than Carpenter's, because in the original black and white movie, as well as in the book, the the whole the whole concept of it of the of the thing, the creature being uh, like sentient plant, you know, part plant was all was also part of that root storyline. Well, Damn it, that was actually a huge uh, Lovecraftian thing. Sure. I mean, you know, Lovecraft, love point. It's like, well, it's partially plant or fungus yeah, as yeah, well as, you know, things. They, like that was, you know, he, he, he loved the concept of it's the, 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 the monster isn't fully animal. It isn't fully plant. It is something uh, in between, uh, which, which I guess that was a, a 1930s thing. Yeah. If like, you know, it's really scary plant people like that's plant people and that's where and that's where and that's why we have shoggoths um but um yeah no um i was going to say yeah the fly uh, yeah i really like the fly um but for me if you want true cronenberg you've got to watch videodrome that's to me is is, oh, yeah. is the yeah. one of the high kind of marks i mean the, all of these films are great i mean the brood well worth a watch it's got, it's got oliver reed in i mean why wouldn't you watch a film with oliver reed in it's just great and um and the you know uh as I say, the uh, you know Videodrome, and then you know Ex- Ends is interesting, but I mean you know Dead Ringers and all that sort of thing. But I think for me, the one I would go back to again and again is probably Videodrome, just because it, I think it just seemed ahead of its time, and the concepts are still, you know, yeah, okay, the video, the, the medium of video is kind of out of date now, but just apply the concept to you know what we have as media now, and it does the same thing. In fact, it's probably more powerful now in a sense um it's good it's good have you guys seen um the um the endless and the res- and resolution by um uh, aaron moorhead and um justin benson kind of yes. yeah i think they're, yeah. I think they're, really, they're great pair of films that obviously go together but the endless for me if you want kind of cosmic horror in a cinema form in a way that kind of you know you can understand um i think it's it's that that film the endless i think i think it's a great film and uh um it's not particularly scary i don't think it's got moments of kind of chilly but but it but it but it's it's more weirdness i guess i guess i mean that's a different i guess that's yeah. a different topic though there's horror films and there's weird films and and some of them aren't the same some of them are i guess there's there was one horror film that for some reason and it's terrible i i'm not even going to say it's good it's it's freaking terrible uh, so one of my parents, one of their first dates they had uh, before they got married was to a, a movie called Burnt Offerings, which is this family who's like house sitting at this house that regenerates through torturing the people living inside the house. And it, it evidently scared my dad so bad that they had to leave the theater. It freaked him <laughs> out hardcore. So as a kid, I grew up being told. Burn Off Rakes is the, the movie that freaked your dad out so bad he had to leave the theater. So I watched this movie uh, when I was about, I guess about 12. And we lived in a really old house that we were constantly re- like a fixer upper uh, sort of old house. And I remember that movie freaked me out so bad. There was this just 
a, a, a driver, like a guy that drove a, a, an ambulance or something who just looked creepy. He did nothing except for look creepy. That was his superpower is he just looked unsettling and it wasn't prosthetics. They just got a creepy looking dude. <laughs> and that movie freaked me out for years. And then I tried to show that to my wife after we got married and she's sitting there the whole time going, really, really? And, and now I'm watching as older. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the hell that was. I don't know how this scared <laughs> anybody. But... <laughs> I remember it well. Yeah, I haven't seen it in many, many years. But I think I had the same kind of a reaction the first time I saw it, as in, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, Mike, you mentioned The Endless. One of the these other more modern um, horror films that I, I've really enjoyed also is uh, The Ritual. Have you seen that? Yeah, I have. Yeah, I did enjoy that. I've actually read the book uh, that it's based on uh, a few years before and uh, enjoyed the novel and kind of forgot the novel a little bit and then went to watch the film and kind of, yeah, yeah, I thought it I thought it was good. I, I don't think it's it's not in my top 10, but I, you know, I have nothing against the film. I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it, I guess. I did. There is some really good uh, psychological, you know, they're, they're kind of, you know, the characters' perceptions of the world around them is changing a lot, like it does in the Endless, and uh, and so I did. I really like that. I, I thought it was my really favorite good. bit in that film. The, now you've said it. it actually, the, the bit I really love in that film is the one where they uh, they all go to sleep, and then is it they wake up and they've all moved around, and and things have changed, and and yep. what were they doing while they were asleep? Kind of thing. yeah. Love did that. I, when did I get undressed? You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I love that. It's <laughs> the same with the um, Oculus the film. Uh, where you've yeah. got, uh, they, they video, they video the room, and then and then it kind of you know they they then you know something happens and then they kind of go okay we're going to watch the video back, and then you watch the video back with them and realize what you've just watched is not what actually happened, and it's like what the hell is going on <laughs> kind of thing. I thought it was really good. Yeah, that's really good. Good stuff. Well, one of the things I think is fantastic that you can do in a, a, a medium like a movie or books or a TV show that you cannot do in a, in a game as much is the concept of the audience knows something that the, the, the characters do not. Uh, you know, the players could get that a little bit through a, a little bit of metagame knowledge, but yeah, you know, that's not the same as, the, the the old Hitchcock um, talking about suspense. The suspense is you know people are sitting around a table talking, and the audience knows there's there's a time bomb underneath the table, and you know so the audience is freaking out, going get out of there, get out of there. There's a bomb in the room, and the characters have no idea, and that's where suspense comes from in, in a film. And you can't get that in a game, or if you can get that in a game, it is catching lightning in a bottle moment. It is it is so hard. To, to get a moment of the audience is aware of something that the characters are completely clueless on. That's one of the difficulties that I think some people have had in, in a gaming situation is you can't capture that type of suspense the way a movie can do it. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. And it really is lightning in a bottle situation because it only happened to me once as a player. Um, and it's and it right, it, <laughs> but it genuinely had an effect on us we were playing uh, one of the Call of Cthulhu campaigns and we're into it really deep. We're not doing very well. And then we hear the name of one NPC that we knew as players from a previous campaign we played. And, and we knew that NPC was bad, bad news. And we suddenly, and we suddenly realized we didn't know that this, that NPC is in this campaign as well. And literally, that our faces were. Oh my! We are completely screwed. We are. All <laughs> <laughs> but that was. Yeah, we knew our characters didn't know that, but we as players did. And it had the it had the optimum effect because we're now. Oh no! What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? What are we gonna do? And um, but it is very rare. You know, it's just got to be. It's just. It's like people say, "How do you make your? How do you make your Call of Cthulhu game scary?" It's kind of well. <laughs> there is no easy answer. Because it's you can't make it scary. It has to be scary because of the conditions at a certain point in time. You know, the, the, the atmosphere is right, the player's attitudes are right, the keeper's attitude is right, the bit in the scenario is right. It's a magical kind of connection. And it's suddenly everyone feels a bit creeped out or scared. 
you can't predict when that's going to be. You can't make it happen because it wouldn't no, work. It's, it's like, you know, make make me laugh. It's like saying, make me laugh. It's, yeah. you know, it's going to be really hard in a role-playing game to do that. But, but at times, they are the most funniest thing you've ever done. It's one of those things if you all you can't force it. You you kind of have to, you know, plan it and water it and kind of sit back and not look directly at it. And that's the only way that you can really capture that versus if you're uh trying to watch the water boil. Uh it's not it's not gonna happen if you force it, or it's just you're making it so much harder. But it's also like the th thing of I've said for years is kind of the difference between horror and fantasy is the lighting, because it's not the situation that happens you know the, the monster doing something horrific um it, it that is not scary it's somehow how you approach it uh, as, as the the gm and the yeah. players and, and and everything else can turn this thing in a dnd &D game when the werewolf jumps out it's like okay great let's roll initiative yeah, are, are you, you lacing want that up your to boots be scary to run or are you drawing your sword to fight you know yeah it, it's, it's kind of this group effort you all have to agree like we're gonna our goal is we want this to be scary. Yeah, that's kind of the only way you can um, really pull that off regularly. Um, and if you pull it off without having that agreement, then congratulations, you you pulled off a very difficult trick. Sometimes it's, it's, and often it's just a moment, isn't it? Is that you, you do something that you don't think particularly is that scary, but you but you you know you try to do kind of creepy things, you know, for the player, uh, for the you know, investigators and the players. And you just do one thing. You know, I did this one thing in a game. I just had this phone ring and the investigator picked it up. And I just, I didn't particularly put on a creepy voice, but I did, you know, it wasn't quite my voice. And I, I can't even remember what I said, but it was just a one sentence kind of like, you know, I'm coming for you or something like that. And the player <laughs> was freaked out for hours. Going like, oh, you really got me. You really got me. And it's like, didn't, I had no idea, you know. But as you say, it's... Uh, it's um, magic in a bottle sometimes, but um, yeah. Uh, so this episode is coming out right before Halloween. So Mike, do you have one more in your pocket? What What is one piece of horror media, whether it's a movie or a TV or a book, what is something that someone should experience this season? Okay, I, I've, I've saved the most scary thing I've ever seen on a television screen. For this bit um and and again you know with the caveat you know not everyone is going to find this scary but for me it, it it still makes me just a shiver run down my spine and it is the um tv adaptation of the mr james story whistle and i'll come to you my lad and um there's been various versions done i'm talking about the one that was done in by the bbc in the late 70s, early 80s, I can't remember exactly the date. Um, and uh, if you know that story, you know that uh, you've got this bumbling professor who goes on a walking holiday by the coast. While he's walking, he finds uh, a whistle. And um, and then kind of like, basically, it's a, well, to be honest, if you've seen It Follows, the film, it's a bit like that. You know, he calls something and it starts coming towards him, basically. And every day it gets a bit closer. You know, you can see it in the distance on the beach come in. And then the next day it's a bit closer, but you can't work out what it is. And then uh, in the end, it's in his room. And that's the bit that, you know, and, it, and it's not, you know, it's not a big monster. It's just basically some bed sheets rising up in the air and like, you know, like the classic ghost <laughs> into the bed sheets. That's possibly the most terrifying thing I have ever seen on screen. And, um, but, you know, it, you may not have the same opinion, but um, it's about, I don't know, half hour, 45 minutes long. I think the whole thing is on YouTube. Turn out all the lights, make sure there's no sound, turn the volume up and watch it, you know, at you know, 12 o'clock on Halloween on your own. And, um, you know, I'm sure you'll be scared. <laughs> That's awesome. Seth? Oh, well, pulling from ones I have not mentioned um, that that still freak me out or I think were just perfect um, was The Mist with, with Thomas Jane that uh, I, I consider that to be just phenomenal. Uh, 
I, I love that on like four different levels of, of things that I love in, in a good horror movie. Um, so the, the, the mist, I consider like, Oh, you got to see that. Just sit back and enjoy that ride. Cause it is not at all going to follow your expectations. So I nice. like it. Really brilliant. Nice. Yeah. I remember watching it with friends. In fact, I was watching it with Paul Pricker. Um, we, we got to the end. I, I'm not going to spoil it, but we got to the end and went, they did it. They actually did it. <laughs> that was so, you know, wow. Yeah. Go and see if you've never seen it. Definitely. Yeah. It's so good. Uh, you know, I, I had a couple that I was thinking of, uh, one that's, uh, actually kind of similar to, uh, uh, Mike's whistle and, uh, you shall come, but I think I'll, instead I'll go with a, um, uh, a Korean horror zombie movie that I really enjoyed, um, alive or hashtag alive. And it is real. I thought really well done, uh, because of the technology. Um, the, the main character is utilizing, uh, technology in a way that I thought was very interesting, you know? So it's a very modern take on the, on the zombie apocalypse thing. Uh, but I, I liked it. I thought it was very clever. So I liked it. It's on Netflix. You can find it. Hashtag alive. Well, that was a great discussion. My personal queue of movies to watch just got a whole lot longer. Oh man. Yes. I totally agree. Lots of good stuff. We want to thank Mike Mason for coming on and chatting with us. It is a pleasure and we'll be hearing from him again soon. Maybe next month, perhaps. Yeah. And, but before we go, Seth, we can't do this show alone. We want to thank our amazing editors, Max Mahaffa and Edwin Nagy, for their hard work and keen skills in making us sound awesome. Definitely, because only they know how many mistakes we really make. Uh, we also want to thank John Sumro for our badass logo. He is a very talented artist, so please follow him on Facebook, check out his official website, and please consider joining his Patreon account. Links below in the show notes. And finally, we want to thank the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets for generously allowing us to use their song, Gluttony, as our intro and outro music. If you're a fan of Lovecraft's writing and the Call of Cthulhu RPG, then you really need to check out the Darkest of the Hillside Thickets. Check out their Bandcamp site and their official band site. Links will, for those will also be in the show notes. Thanks for listening. Yes, thank you again.